but staff, but staff are doing the job that I used to do, but maybe they've been doing it at a much lower pace than they used to and have now got used to the lower pace. And the question is, can they operate at the higher intensity now? And I think I mentioned that um, air traffic control manager I was speaking to just a couple of weeks ago raised exactly this issue. He said, we have teams who are still in the same control tower at the same aerodrome that they have always been, but they've been working in very quiet shifts lately or over the last 18 months. And he was worried, will they be ready and will they be capable of operating at a high intensity level that they used to operate at? So really interesting point. And I think this Qantas incident showed that that can be true, that can happen. Um, there were many un, unrecognized implications of change or unmanaged change. Many of the pandemic induced changes across the organization combined with high management workload resulted in the change not being recognized. So this is interesting. But while some people are operating at a very low level at the moment, others are working at a very intense level. And I think at flight planning, route planning levels, I hear in quite a few airlines, they are working very intensely because nothing is routine anymore. What was a routine route that was flown all the time, you only had to plan it once. You only had to do the navigation plans once the authorizations, et cetera. Now the routes are flown occasionally or a new route is put in or it's changed. And so that actually needs a lot of work, a lot of planning. And so some people are actually working very hard whilst others are, are not. So I don't know whether anyone in Vietnam Airlines has noticed that. Yeah, so it's a really interesting uh, case study, I think, and I think you're, the fact you've done a lot of work on pandemic recovery is really gives you a lot of confidence because clearly these are very real risks and even some of the airlines that have very high, uh, good safety records are falling foul of some of these changes. Does anyone got any comments on this one? Um, uh, yes, just a question, hmm. not a comment. Um, for the first, so you are listing out human errors, right? So for hmm. the first, you said that staff move to different roles to fill gaps. But I feel like it's not necessary, has to be human errors, like it's not his fault uh, that he has to move to different roles. So can you still list it as human errors? Hmm. It's more like um, I, I don't know what is the name for it, but maybe mm. it's the name as well. Because, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, perhaps it's just the word error. Error okay. doesn't mean fault. Mm. Error means that something didn't occur as it should have done. Uh, and I think that just culture regime is very strong on this point, but you cannot you should not blame the person, you should quite blame the system. How did the system allow that person to be in a position where they made a mistake or did not follow a procedure or did not know the procedure? Um, how the, why was the, okay, why was the mistake made rather than who made the mistake? <laughs> yeah, um, so try not to blame it's easy to blame, it's our instinct to blame people, but we should try not to and think, blame the system. The system failed to prepare that person for that role. Um, there was an interesting case with Air New Zealand uh, after I left it, um, but I, I'm very aware of this one. You may be aware Air New Zealand lost an A320 off Toulouse during a test flight. Um, five, three, five, six people lost. It was actually being flown by German pilots because the aircraft actually at the time was leased to a German airline. 
and they were doing test flights before handing it back to Air New Zealand. Um, and a number of things that occurred on the ground that resulted in the aircraft not being airworthy. In flight, a test, a flight test was undertaken despite being below the safe altitude to start that test. So an error was made by the pilots. But the Air New Zealand pilot was sitting in the jump seat and in theory should have stopped the test being carried out. He should have said, oh, hang on, you're too low. But he didn't, he wasn't aware of this rule. So Air New Zealand did an investigation and blamed themselves for not preparing that pilot for the role of an observer. He actually was prepared as a, a normal pilot. He had not had special training for the role he was about to undertake for that one trip. So Air New Zealand blamed itself, blamed its own systems rather than the person. Hmm. So it's a good example, I think, of just culture. It is the system that lets us down, not the person. So in this case, the system has failed to train the person, so an error is made. It may be made by a person, but the cause is the system. Hmm. Does that help explain the point? Yes. So it's just a wording that the error is not anyone's fault. I think that's, hmm. a, that's really... That's a really important difference, yeah. It's not fault, it's an error, yeah. Mm. I think anyone who's been on a Just Culture course will recognize that, I think. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, really, I think you're absolutely right to be doing risk assessments on pandemic recovery uh, because it's caused so much change and so much uh, unusual circumstances um, that we have to be very conscious to look for those risks before they occur. Okay, the, the other thing I wanted to, um, to just look again at is context and criteria. Uh, and by chance, I've been doing some work with a Pacific Aviation Safety Organization um, and they've asked us to look at a number of points, but one of them is the effect of COVID pandemic. So what we've started to do is to consider the phases of recovery from a pandemic, particularly for small airlines in the Pacific that may have not been flying any aircraft for a while, uh, never mind reduced flying. Um, these are very small airlines. They do not have a lot of resource um, and everything is hard for them. They do not have a lot of people. Getting spares is difficult. Very maritime environment that causes a lot of corrosion and maintenance on aircraft. So there are a lot of challenges anyway. And so they've said, can you help us consider the effect of pandemic recovery? So we've been looking at the context before looking at the impact. So one thing is we said, okay, then there's phases to the recovery, maybe returning to service from, from no activity. So that might be an aerodrome or an airport or a fleet or a team of people. You have to restart your operation. And then having restarted the operation, there's a recovery phase where you build up and hopefully return to normal. Uh, increase in activity levels. It is clear the risk is higher than under business as usual. So we started to look at a context for not just airport airlines, but also airports and air traffic services. Maybe it's necessary to meet of a demand. What we're saying is there may be a surge of demand for for seats um, from passengers, from people going on a holiday to the Pacific. But it may be better to be careful and ramp up. Don't fulfill all those demands. 
you may not be able to ramp up that quickly. Um, clearly managing aircraft airworthiness, pre preparation for flight, maintenance, uh, long periods of downtime and storage and parking. Health and safety standards, currency, not only um, people working in an environment when they're now not familiar with, but also the pandemic itself, as you've identified yourselves. How do you monitor for risks and safety performance? Does that need special extra monitoring? And then the obvious ones of how do you control the virus, uh, mitigate the direct risk of a virus? And lastly, um, recovering procedures. So we, we've looked at, for example, in this case, these are small countries, they need a lot of assistance. So we've looked at each one is a slightly different context. And so when are they likely to start recovering from a pandemic? And therefore, when is the greatest demand for support? So this is a context for the safety organization that supports all these countries. We're saying it's likely that quite a few countries are going to open up their borders at the same time. So you'll have a very high level of demand at the same time as a high level of risk. So time to start thinking about this strategy. Do you ask countries to open up in a staggered way? Do you ask them to open up slowly? There's a number of things we haven't got to that stage yet. So we're just trying to set the context before identifying risks. And uh, we're using Fiji as a case study because Fiji have already opened up. If you recall, they, they, you may be aware they didn't have any COVID and it got into them, into their country. They were hit very badly. Um, but their, their economy relies so heavily on, on foreign tourists that they need to open up. So they've started to open up before everyone else in the Pacific. So it's been useful. We can observe how it's affected Fijian airlines and Fijian airways, uh, domestic and international, to use that to inform our risk assessment for the other countries. So we've looked at dates of operation, what were the rules that were put in place, um, quarantine rules, border rules, what are requirements for entry. These are being set by the health authorities rather than as well as the airlines. Proof of vaccination, tests, so these are all mitigations that are happening anyway. And so that influences the level of risk for the airlines. Um, self-isolation. So it's really going through the detail of what they did to see if it's because this changes the context for a risk assessment. Um, and so, so quite a lot of detail, but still just looking at context before we start a risk assessment. So I thought that might be quite useful in that um, the exercise we did this afternoon or this morning, this afternoon, at times, I think it would have been useful if we'd stopped first and, and done a context statement. Um, how fast are things going to open? Is domestic going to open, then international? Um, is it going to open and then shut down again? So as a, as a whole range of the external context or environment that influences a risk. And as we were going through the exercise, I was thinking, ah, I should have asked everyone to perhaps write a context statement first to see if everyone has the same picture of what the future might look like. There's clearly a lot of uncertainty, but it's quite a useful exercise to go through. Uh, anyone got any comments on, on that one? Uh, you may have other airlines that you, I don't know about benchmark, but to see as having similar problems or similar challenges, and maybe it's worth exploring how 
uh, what procedures they're put in place or what's affecting them, how, how well they're responding, learning from each other. Okay, um, the other thing that I thought was useful just to, um, as part of that project, I've been researching what a guidance has been put out formally, officially, and IATA has actually done quite a lot of work on uh, managing aircraft or recovering from a pandemic. And this guidance here is just one of those that they've published, guidance on managing aircraft everywhere for operations during a post-pandemic. So it's clear that a lot of people have been worrying and thinking about this. And I don't know whether anyone's aware of this one, um, but it's not the only guidance they've put out. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, they've also put out health and safety standards for airline operators. Um, I also guidance on safety monitoring. Um, uh, safety, health and safety checklists for airline operators. Cleaning and disinfecting guidance, guidance on cabin operations and guidance on flight operations. So, uh, and, the, and there's more. So that's for aircraft operators. For ground operations, there's a position paper on restarting ground operations. There's ground handling return to service. Guidance on ground handling during uh, COVID and ground in, handling information about conducting operations in time of COVID. So it's quite a lot of material and if you're not aware of this, I think it, it's well worth a read. Um, it may be that you are more advanced uh, and you've done work, but it's always useful to, to have a look at what else other teams have come up with um, to, to help ensure that you've identified all the risks. And interestingly, I often have done a complete risk assessment on um, safety risk assessment on return to service. Um, so again, that might, you might find that a really useful document. It's quite extensive. Um, I can't remember how many risks, but um, you'll see that their risk, um, made a risk register is slightly different to ones we've been using, but very similar. They talk about an event, hazard, worst case scenario, and then the idea is you put in your own existing controls, you rate your own risk, and then they're proposing some particular mitigation actions um, to come up with a rate in, in this case, I said Tobol, with mitigation actions. So um, again, that might be very useful material to for, for teams to look at. Um, risk assessment is a safety risk assessment, but as you've seen, there's guidance on all various subjects. Um, I noticed that's dated 20, October 2020. So I suspect when this was being written, no one expected we'd still be locked down a year later. But that's how it is. Just for your information, this is their risk register, uh, risk rating scale. Um, very similar, of course, but but slightly different. Um, they've used slightly different words, hazardous, um, and slightly different um, descriptions of a consequence, um, and a similar probability scale. Um, but they don't give a scope for that scale in terms of is it just the airline or is it the industry or is it just the airport? And their matrix, I think, looks very similar to the one we've just seen in your own SMS document. Is that the same one? Does anyone know yours? It looks very similar. Very similar, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
um, and they also have a diagram on a LARP, which I think falls into this. I think this is incorrect, and I think acceptable based on risk mitigation, it may require management decision. See, this isn't strictly correct, I would argue. What this region should say is acceptable after all practical mitigation measures have been taken. So I don't, this is actually, I've written a K, I think it's the IATA one. Um, I personally think this is wrong. This is that they are not really understanding how a LARP works and what it requires. It's, it's a simplified version. It, this would suggest that if you just inside the tolerable reason, that's all good. Even though you could do better. Um, yeah, so um, that's certainly my view. And if you read the history of how a LARP was developed, and it was developed in the UK, as I said, after some major accidents, um, both nuclear and chemical and oil industry accidents. Um, they did a lot of work, a lot of very good work to invent the LARP system. Um, and this is not quite correct. Um, this is a list of some of the risks they've, um, they've identified. Um, and again, I think it would be very useful for you, for you and your teams to, to have a look through these and see if they can help identify risks that may not have been uh, identified before. Um, clearly they're talking about uh, air operator certificates uh, needing to be perhaps recovered uh, or reapplied for sometimes. Um, they talk about maintenance organizations and aircraft here. Um, interest in parking aircraft in positions designated outside typical areas for stationed in traffic surfaces. So uh, the, the risk that was mentioned earlier about uh, aircraft being parked close to each other than normal, it's, it's right here. Yeah, so really interesting, I think, to go through these um, as a prompt. Have we thought about everything? Have IATA or K or anyone else thought about some risks that we haven't thought about? Um, store it in, in less than ideal conditions, prolonged parking, plugs installed, uh, pitot tube covers, all sorts of things that might be left on that wouldn't <laughs> normally be on. Um, So this is all about parking, record keeping, um, operation aircraft engines, additional maintenance. Yeah, really interesting um, to step through these. Contamination of fuel. Um, not fit for flight, spare parts, unskilled personnel performing. Uh, return to service checks. So um, yeah, quite quite useful to step through these um, as a way of helping to ensure you've identified all the risks. This, this isn't to suggest this is complete, but with your own work and this, you, it's probably a very, very useful tool, a very valuable uh, guidance. Uh, has anyone got any comments? Has anyone seen this before? No. 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 Not. Okay. Uh, I think the links are in the presentation. Um, if they're not, I can easily. It's easy to find. Very easy. Uh, post pandemic recovery, IATA in Google. Okay. Um, so we've probably done quite a lot on pandemic, and probably rightly so. It is quite a risk. Um, 
But um, uh, like I said, I thought that was very useful to do that. And I think it's very useful to consider context. And you may want to also consider scenarios. So um, at work we're doing with Pacific, we're going to build up some scenarios, a delayed pandemic, a drawn out pandemic recovery, a rapid recovery, because the risks are different. Um, Uh, in terms of the quantum of the risks as well as the, the um, risks themselves. So you may want to consider what if a recovery happens very quickly next year? What if Omicom turns out to be not so bad and we all catch it and we're all, all healthy? Um, we don't need to be vaccinated. Or is it, there's another variant, what's the effect? How long can we just keep going just surviving. Hmm. So it's quite a lot of work to do, I think, um, to explore the different scenarios. Okay. Um, the next piece I was going to cover was this more bit of theory again. Uh, we've done quite a lot of practical work over the last uh, rest of this or most of today. So I thought I'd finish with just some more advanced theory um, before we end close and just recap on everything we've done. Like I say, if there's anything that people wanted to talk about that hasn't, we haven't covered, then please, please say so. So this, uh, the next few slides are about decision-making under risk, how we make decisions despite risk. Um, and this is work um, that came out of the North Sea oil industry. Um, I mentioned the British had had some bad accidents and one of them was the Piper Alpha explosion where the oil rig uh, burst into flames, exploded and then sank, um, losing all 230 men on board. That really got the oil industry to think, what is it we're not doing right? How can that possibly happen despite all our safety measures, despite all our risk assessments? What is it that we're not doing well? So it really challenged them and they put a lot of effort in trying to understand how do you manage risk? Or how do you make decisions around risk? So what they realized or came up with, and I think it's really good. And what's interesting, this was done in about 1990, late 1990s. I think it was published in 1999. It is still the same guidance now. So it has barely changed over all that time. What's that now? 25. 25 years, uh, which suggests it's it's probably very good. What they realized is there's a range of ways that we actually manage risk. For normal standard management of risk, we simply apply standards and codes of practice and procedures, and we simply follow those procedures. And aviation is full of procedures. We also expect and understand what good practice looks like. We know when people are not following good practice. If they're untidy or ill-disciplined, that's not good practice. We expect people to be disciplined and tidy and work very professionally. We also expect, particularly the more senior and the more trained people to apply professional judgment all the time. Use your professional judgment when making decisions. We do from time to time require to, are required to do detailed analysis. And some of the case studies I showed you this morning are examples of very detailed analysis. Um, and you, 
some examples this afternoon have been very detailed. That is necessary from time to time. We also have a value system. A company has values. They've been pub they're published. They agreed. This is a way we expect to behave. This is how we expect to behave and expect our people to behave. And also the society in which we live has values. This is how we and our company are expected to behave. What we considered accept consider acceptable and less acceptable. So there's what they decided there was six ways we manage risk, but we use them in different ways at different times. And so they came up with this diagram. It's quite a complicated looking diagram, but it's actually simpler than it may seem. What they said is there's different types of decision that have to be made. There's simple decisions that we make every day. There's some difficult decisions that we have to make from time to time. And sometimes we have to make very complex decisions. We have complex problems to solve. And depending on how complex a problem is, depends on which of those six tools you use. So those six tools you see are written here on this diagram, on these areas of this diagram. So what they said was, if this problem is simple, we draw a line through the diagram here. And if it is a, a well understood situation, that we, we have no problem understanding. We mainly use codes and procedures with some reliance on good practice and professional judgment. So if you see here, a, a long line, codes and we use a lot of codes and practice uh, procedures. We use some good practice <coughs> and we use some professional judgment whenever we go about our day-to-day -day work and making simple decisions where there is risk. So everyone with me? Yes. Okay. Conversely, if it's a very complex decision, we cannot rely on standards because we haven't written any. It's an unusual, highly complex decision we use, we haven't seen before or haven't seen for a very long time. It's not business as usual. So we can't use any procedures because we haven't written them. We can't really use judgment because we haven't seen this before. So we have to rely on analysis in so far as we can analyze the problem. But ultimately we've got to make some value judgments. Can we accept this level of risk? Are the, do the benefits outweigh the perceived level of risk? And so that's for very complex decisions. And that's usually made government level or regulators when they write the rules, for example. In the middle, we have difficult decisions. And they, there we may have some procedures that are useful. We definitely rely on practice and professional judgment, but we also do a lot of detailed analysis to understand the problem better. So those examples I gave you, the Jetstar one, for example, um, a shortened runway one, where we had to do a lot of analysis. This is where we were. We were making difficult decisions. So we used a lot of analysis. We got a lot of pilots and professionals, air traffic controllers in the room, and we debated the problems. We considered what good practice was. And if there were procedures, we applied them. And this is how they summed up these problems. They said a simple one is nothing new or unusual, well understood risks, there is established practice, and there's few stakeholder implications. That's a simple decision. So we manage risk mainly by following procedures, maybe refining a procedure or writing a new procedure, but we just get everyone to do it the same way. The more complex decisions, change, 
new fleet introduction, new, um, so the examples I gave, uh, unusual flight procedures. Where there's life uh, cycle implications, there's some trade-off between risks, there's some uncertainty or deviation from standard or best practice. And there may be some significant cost implications. So that's where we do a lot of analysis and, a, and a seek a professional judgment from a cohort or a group of people and expect good practice and maybe have some procedures. And then lastly, there's very challenging novel situations, very significant trades off in risk, significant uncertainties, and possibly a per perception or a perceived lowering of standards. That's when really, although we can do some analysis, ultimately we've got to make a value judgment of whether we're going to accept that risk. And I think governments have, have been in, operating in this area with a pandemic, having to make trade-offs between what society will accept, um, what can be done, uh, the, the balance between economic health and human health, the country's health. Some countries have done it better than others. Um, uh, and, um, but it's, it's largely a value-driven question. What, what are we going to accept? How much economic impact can we accept to protect people, for example? It's a value judgment. So I don't, that might be quite useful to people um, to understand why it is that we do some risk assessments really very simply. Just follow the matrix. Yeah, that's a high, that's a medium. That's a mitigation. But sometimes we have to go into much lower, higher level of detail and do some really detailed analysis because it's new. We don't really understand the situation. The consequences may be quite significant. And we really have to put the resources in to understand it and then make a decision, maybe by appliance and values. And lastly, very seldom and usually at a much higher level decisions come down to values. What do people value most? So like I say, this was developed by the oil industry after a major accident, um, um, an accident that forced them to say, what is it that we're not doing right? Why can't we get this right? How come after so many years of doing risk assessments and safety cases, we still had a major accident. What was it we got wrong? And it's, it's, it was really impressive that they looked at themselves and honestly asked a question and did some excellent work to try and understand it. Uh, and they still apply this 25 years later. Uh, and as far as I can I believe, the North Sea oil industry hasn't had a major accident since. They've had problems, but not a major loss of life accident. They've had helicopters crash, et cetera, but not loss of an oil rig. Hmm. So I think it's useful to look at other industries, other safety critical industries like the nuclear industry and the oil industry to see what they're doing, to see if there's anything that can be learned. Okay, anyone got any, questions, uh, any comments on that? No, no, no. Okay. Um, the other thing I've put, I just put a few extra slides in just because we touched on it yesterday, but not in any detail. Um, the layers of defense or the barrier method, the James Reason for Swiss cheese model. Uh, I'm sure quite a few of you have seen this before. Um, and someone commented to me a couple of years ago that this was old hat, this was history. No one, I said, it's not history. This is an exceptional piece of work. <laughs> Nothing has changed. This underpins most of what we do in the aviation sector. We build layers of defense 
to prevent an accident happening. Interestingly, that comment was made by someone who was not in aviation background, and they were quite an academic person um, and hadn't actually worked in a high risk environment themselves. So I, so I dismissed their view of, a, view of it. I think this is an exceptional piece of work um, that we should continue to apply. So what we're saying is, yeah, we've got a risk. We can understand that it could lead to an accident. And so we do put in place not just one procedure, not just training, not just engineered controls, but also perhaps an audit. Layers of defense constantly reinforcing the, the, the gap between the hazard and the outcome. So I, here I've suggested the engineering barriers, the hard barriers, the very re reliable barriers. There's operational barriers, which are usually implemented by people and so probably not as strong, more prone to weaknesses. There's management barriers that make sure these happen. And then we check and check again and check again and ins audit and inspect to make sure these are all working and they're in place. Um, so I would argue this, this is not out of date. This is critical to the way we think. And there's lots of ways we can show this. And this is quite a, a nice image, I think, of an accident starts and we have to put a barrier to stop it progressing to the end. So I particularly very much like this photograph. I can't remember where it comes from. But um, yeah. So that's the theory, um, James Reason theory. Um, but how do we apply it in practice? And I personally think for the best way to consider this, one of the best tools available to us when we're doing a risk analysis of a detailed problem is to use a bow tie analysis. So bow tie, uh, why a bow tie? Because it looks like a bow tie. <laughs> and that's why it's called a bow tie. <laughs> um, and interestingly, I was introduced to this many years ago by someone who worked in IT, information technology. And they were using it as part of understanding, protecting an airline, it was an airline actually, airline IT system from attack and failure. So how it works is on, on this side of a diagram, we consider all the threats or hazards. And we think, well, what could happen? So in this example, loss and containment, the aircraft is outside the flight boundary. So we think all the hazards that could could cause that to happen. That's called the top event, it's technically. And then if it happens, what responses can we put in place to stop a consequence we're trying to avoid? So say this is aircraft accident. This is the aircraft not in the correct location. What would cause that to happen what can we do? What layers of defense can we put in place to prevent that happening? And if that happens, what responses can we build to stop the consequence happening? So you think of threats, for example, adverse wind conditions, engine failure, aircraft or oh, pilot situational awareness. And we think, okay, so significant adverse winds could force the aircraft to be out of, out of a containment boundary. And that in turn could lead to a fatal accident. So what are the barriers, using James Reason's model, what are the barriers to prevent loss of containment? And then should loss of containment occur, what are the response measures 
that can be put in place to prevent fatal accident. So it's a very in simple concept, but it helps us to picture exactly, are we talking about a preventative me mitigation or a response mitigation? What exactly are we trying to prevent? Because this is a precursor to that. So when you use these tools, it's actually really important to get the description of this event right. And if you want some good guidance on bow tie analysis, I think one of the best I've read is on the UK CAA website. Um, the reason I think it's very well written and very well explained, I think is because the authors have clearly used this tool. You can tell the way they write about it. They have used it. They've made mistakes. They've learned by their mistakes and they've written a very good explanation. There are software tools that work with this. Um, Bowtie XP is the most well-known one. I think it's a Dutch uh, software. Um, but sometimes the software gets in the way of a concept. And so I think it's really important to understand the concept uh, before applying a software tool. And like I say, I think the Civil Aviation Authority of the UK has a very good explanation of how to use this tool. Uh, it conforms with um, the international standards. If you apply this tool, you will be conforming to the standards. And ISO 31010 does list a bow tie analysis uh, as an acceptable analysis tool. The, this standard actually lists quite a lot of analysis, but it sets out, it's a useful standard because it sets out what types of analysis and what their strengths and weaknesses are, what they're useful for and what they're not so useful for. Okay. Um, here's an example. It's a real example um, of a bow tie uh, method used in this case for IT security. And um, airlines rely on IT. And so a really significant risk for any airline is um, a failure of IT system. Uh, lots of airlines have been hit by IT failures. Um, and so I think it's certainly someone in Vietnam Airways hopefully is looking at IT security and the risks to your booking engines um, and all the other software that we use in aviation flight planning, you name it, um, so much IT that we basically cannot operate without our, our IT systems. So in this case, uh, we looked at uh, a malicious actor, a malicious actor, someone intent on doing harm, could be a state actor, it could be a local person who's disaffected or a disaffected staff member, or sorry, disaffected um, external person. It could be a staff error, so inadvertent error, they like just make a mistake, or they didn't follow procedure, they did an incorrect action. Or it could be your suppliers. A supplier may have made an error or may actually have been intentional. So uh, these are examples of, not a complete list, but examples of the human threats to the system rather than the engineering threats. And then we looked at how we could mitigate each of these. Firstly, prevent uh, loss of data or loss of a control network or breach of data or compromised protections. So we said, well, you could try and detect an attack and you could put software controls to protect against it. And here with these are very technical controls um, built into the system to detect, to identify, protect or notify of an attack. And then should a loss of data occur or control failure, 
what response measures were in place. So in this case, there were system controls to advise that the system had, had lost control of a the system. There were engineered protections um, and there were recovery plans. So that was, this is a, a real example, just how bow ties has been used. Um, they don't all have to look the same and they have to be built to solve a particular analysis problem. And my first step is to figure out what this top event is. And like I say, if you want to know more about this tool, I would strongly recommend the UK Civil Aviation Authority's description. Very, very useful tool. And I think aside from a risk matrix, I would say this is the next most useful tool um, without having to call in specialists um, to carry out perhaps quantitative analysis. We've talked about um, a LARP. Um, and the last slide I had Oh, this is another way of looking at a LARP for um, multiple, multiple death situations. It's very academic. This is, is how do we decide basically whether an airline design is safe or not or safe enough? What are the targets that we should be aiming for in aviation? And these are very low numbers. But what it says is for more people at risk, say 100 people on aircraft, the higher level of safety we should be achieving than if it's a small number of people at risk. So 10 people, your safety target will be lower than, less rigorous than if you've got, say, a aircraft full of people. So that's just some theory there. That's all part of the LARP thing. We say is we've got unacceptable regions, as low as reasonable, practical region, acceptable region. And it differs depending on the level of consequence. In this case, the consequence measured the number of people put in harm's way. Okay. So I'm just looking at the time now. We're quarter, quarter past four. I've just... Uh, okay, we can open up for any final questions if mm -hmm. you would like. It's okay, it's a good wrap up. I think if you want to have any other summary. Has anyone got, like I say, anything that we haven't talked about that you would find useful or we're expecting to talk about? Uh, there's no more questions, so yes, we can just sum up the class. Okay. okay. I just got uh, just a few more slides here just to close off. So I just share my screen again. So I'm just trying to find my control here, share screen. Here we go. Uh, yeah, no problem. You know, <laughs> a long day. <laughs> um, here we go. Okay, so we've completed a course on advanced risk management. Um, the objective of the course was to develop a good working level understanding of general risk management as applicable to parts of a complex business such as aviation to form a foundation for the development of core expertise across the group. So hopefully we've achieved that. Hopefully you've uh, now between you and individually gained something from this course. I suspect some have gained more than others because some clearly have some practice in risk management, uh, risk assessment. Um, but hopefully everyone's gained something. Um, the agenda we followed, we covered off some fundamentals of risk management. We did briefly touched on the history. I introduced the ISO 31000 standard in particular. 
and we step through the eight, nine, 10 principles of effective risk management. That's the important word there is we can do risk management, but to be effective, we need to check ourselves against the principles, dynamic, take cultural factors into account, recognize uncertainty, be dynamic, etc. cetera. Um, then we went in some detail through the risk management process, starting with context, scope, criteria, before actually trying to identify risk and completing the risk assessment part. Don't forget to communicate, consult, review, and record and report risks. We applied the principles. We looked more at quite a lot of theory of how we build matrix and of just now some more theory. Uh, and then we applied it in some exercises um, to, to identify risks. We can talked about a pandemic quite a lot, which is not surprising given the situation we're in now. We looked at how to assess risks, um, uh, look, considering raw risks and residual risk, um, the importance of understanding the objective. So one risk may actually have a number of uh, criteria it's got to meet. So we looked at the effect of pandemic and it's useful to write the objectives write the context, write the objectives and consider safety, consider efficiency, consider customer service, be very clear what types of risk uh, you're considering and there may be more than one type of risk for a given situation or hazard. We talked about, so we've been through all this, the matrix, different types of matrices, different types of risk registers, risk assessment process, and we had an ex exercise of applying it. And there we go. So hopefully everyone, or most people found that useful um, and valuable. Um, I must admit, I've, I've really enjoyed it. it. It's been some really good comments coming through. I know there haven't been many, but when they have, they've been really good. <laughs> Honestly, um, I'm very Sorry. surprised. Before I came up with the answer, some people usually had the answer ready. Um, so I very much appreciate that. Um, the 10 questions we did, I think most people have got them and I'm sure by now everyone would have got 100%. Yeah. So I appreciate everyone's persistence. We're using Zoom, it's not so easy. It's, and thanks for trying to work in groups on Zoom. Um, we're all having to learn how to cope in this pandemic environment. So thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. So um, actually, before you go, we would like to take a picture with you with everyone in the room. So just be right there. We stand like next to the screen. So, <laughs> and we'll just take a picture with you. <laughs> it's very, very different. Uh, các anh chị nào online thì các anh chị bật cam lên nhé. Bọn em thì sẽ <laughs> chụp <cái> màn hình ạ. <laughs> Okay, à, các anh nên lại đứng cạnh màn hình luôn. <cười> okay, wait a second. <cười> can we wave? Can we wave? <cười> yes, we can wave, but yeah, we see it standing next to you. Wait, wait, wait a second. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, tiên đứng lên. Tiên đứng cạnh mình. Tiên đứng cạnh mình. Tiên đứng cạnh mình. Okay, give us one second. Thank you. <cười> anh đếm nhá. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Spotlight. Okay. Spotlight. Okay. Wait for a second. How do I spotlight? Okay. Please look at the camera. Yes. Please look at the camera and we take a picture like now. Anh đếm nhá. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Great to have met everyone. Thank Great you. to have met everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Nice day. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Hope to see you in that one, one day I'll get to Vietnam in person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Ron. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Cái tài liệu này bọn anh để trong driver Em sẽ upload hết lên trang web văn hóa an toàn anh chị nhé VHAT.vietnamelines.com ạ Ok ok Check Đừng, okay. Uh, Nếu mà có ở trên đấy thì bọn anh đã về tải về nhiều Trang đấy đã có tài liệu Bọn anh sẽ tải về bọn anh đọc Đã phải tìm <cười> Xin chào tất cả mọi người nha. Chào. Chào tất cả các anh chị ạ. Có phải làm bài kiểm tra không em? Ôi đừng. Không phải làm bài kiểm tra đâu. Hết rồi. Anh kiểm tra làm hết rồi gì nữa em?